Okay, gentlemen, is everyone still alive? Still awake? Yeah. Fantastic. My name is Marcus, Marcus Neumann from Germany. Most of us have had conversations already. And my presentation is about how to bridge the provisioning gap. So provisioning gap, what the provisioning stuff all about. So quick check, who's using provisioning here? Really? Okay. Who else is using provisioning? If you're not using oh. provisioning, you're not using open because provisioning is getting nodes in. I paid him to say that. <laughs> okay. So provisioning, let's just do a very, very short look at provisioning just from the perspective that I need for the talk. And the only real important piece for this talk is that a, the provisioning is basically a mechanism to get nodes into OpenMS and it's all built around a nice XML based structure which is also uh, defined in an XSD so you can make um, advanced checks against it and um, explore the structure. And then you have this XML document with all the stuff in it and then you can use uh, a REST interface and push that XML into OpenMS. Or you use provision PL, which is kind of a command line script thingy that's basically doing the same. It's also just hitting the uh, REST API and gets your nodes into the system. Okay. So the third way is the web UI. So is anyone maintaining many nodes in the web UI in this requisition view? I, I know about this group there. Okay, you too. So how many nodes? couple of hundred, it's fun, right? It's great. You have all these lines and clicking and moving. It's fantastic. So um, just to recap for those that are not using um, provisioning a lot, the only thing that's really written into a requisition XML is, is a hierarchical structure. It starts with a node and this node has one or many categories. Then it has some assets like city or street or address or a vendor or serial number and then you have interfaces which are basically IP interfaces in most cases so you have an IP address a status for that and then you can attach services to that okay so it's not a super complicated model and that's the only piece we really need to um, for the top so we said though in this uh, in this requisition there's things like node labels IP addresses. There might be information about um, the geo coordinates. It's all part of the assets. Then there might be who's the contact to talk to if this machine is down, or um, what is the what is the job of this machine? What is the purpose of the machine? The role in the network? Like, is it a web server or is it in production or just testing? There's all stuff that you model in your requisition with categories or assets um, and of course IP addresses and stuff, right? So if you have an environment and you want to do a good monitoring, you have to get this data. So one of the standard questions is who knows all these things? So who can I ask for all the IP addresses I should monitor, for all the services I should not monitor, where they are, who's responsible? It's a very important question. And usually the answer is we have this other system. System can be something um, advanced, something what is really a software, like an OCS inventory or uh, a custom-made CMDB. So who is using um, an inventory software? Who is using a homemade uh, CMDB. <coughs> okay, let's give more. Um, who's using the VMware in, uh, VMware environment to get some information about the machines from there? Okay. Um, so there are many sources like that. So anyone has a particular tool they're using? Like uh, we had yesterday we had like uh, um, Puppet and Frontman, right? 
Any, anyone else who uses a certain open source tool for that? What is it? I've, I've written a, it's just a Perl script that actually connects to the underlying NS SQL database of VMware. Uh huh. Yeah, it's, it's one, one case, right? And it shoves it through provision .pl. Mm -hmm. so okay. So that is that is one nice option. And even if people have uh, CMDB running or they have the VMware integration running, so it's usually just another system. So this piece of information, so the geolocations, it's in the other system. The next information is in the other other system. And then in the other 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 system. So you jump around a lot and it's, it's hard to get all this data together. Um, so for example, for the VMware case, um, we have ways to get that out there. And that is in the provisioning uh, world we have URL requisitions so you can point provision D to a URL and you can do something like VMware um, colon slash slash then the address of the vCenter credentials uh, what you want to filter and it's going to talk to <coughs> the uh, vCenter and read the stuff out that you want to have and build a requisition out of it we have something similar for DNS so you can ask your DNS with a zone transfer protocol to get your um, IP addresses and DNS names, which is nice, but still you're going to miss information what services should be on these machines or who's responsible for them or what the name of the building is and in what floor they are standing, right? So just in the other, other system, right? So using these URL requisitions is kind of a quick way. It's all there out of the box. You can just go right in this one line, huge line with all the bits and pieces and start it and synchronize it and then you will see what you get. So there's no preview mechanism. It's hard to check how would it how is it going to look like and you have relatively little influence on what to do with it. That might have been a problem for you, so you <coughs> have your own VMware integration piece. So the customization of uh, the customization is limited, configuration is limited. If you really want to customize it you have to change the openness source code, like in the core, which is fun, which you should all do, but it's probably not everyone's hobby, right? So what happens then is you build your custom integration. That's a custom integration recipe. You probably followed something pretty similar. So the ingredients are very simple. You use whatever language starts with, start, starts with P, like Perl or Python. Some use Ruby, that's okay. <coughs> and then you use usually provision PL, like in your case, or directly the REST interface, or you write files out, whatever. Then you use XML lint to check if your XML you are building, like this requisition, has to be uh, well formed, it has to be valid. Then you have some SQL, it's exactly your case, pretty nice. And you grab from somewhere something, then you build it in XML shapes, and you check if it's really XML, and then you just push it. Uh, this um, provision PL over to OpenMS and then it's going to work. So that's the directions to do it. Extract the data, make nice XML out of it, check if it's well formed, check if it's valid against the um, XSD, so it's just the tags are in the XML that you should have. And then call provision PL and everything's fine. And that's a totally valid way. So who has something in place like this? there, you have one of those, you've written some of those, there, head shaking, okay. So that is the default way to do it, right? So that is the custom approach to build your integration with your inventory or with your um, VMware thingy, with whatever, right? There's they're usually quite similar, but there is this custom bit that is specific for your environment, like all our services start with Uber, don't care, don't matter, right? Okay, so what have we done to address that a little bit is we've made a, so we, we're actually running a, a project at the moment which was originally called PRIS, it's how some of you already know it, or uh, Inventory Integration Server, and it's a tiny program that can help you doing this kind of integrations. The language it's written in is doesn't start with P, we are sorry, it's a Java application. It's a small one, <coughs> you can just start it on your command line with java minus jar and start it. And 
it's also not configured with XML we are sorry to it's property files so very simple very very small and it can help you to um, <coughs> generate requisitions from various different systems okay so how it works we have a driver that's a most abstract component that thingy has the driver says if it should put out a file and should just be called once and then terminate and write the requisition as a file somewhere or you use the default one that's a HTTP one so you start your small program it spins up a HTTP server and sits there and waits until someone asks for a requisition okay that's a driver piece then you have the source the source is a thingy that talks to whatever um, external system you want to talk to like if you want to talk to an OCS you put in the OCS source and the OCS source knows how to talk with an OCS inventory via whatever interface in that case via the SOAP interface and is able to retrieve their data model and um, understand it get the communication um, fleshed out so that is that what the source is for right um, we have sources for spreadsheets it's very sophisticated and then you have um, sources for database connections you can just put in a generic database source put your query in and it's going to uh, create you a nice requisition based on it the third components are mappers um, at the moment the only implementation we have that really needs a mapper is the OCS inventory um, source the mapper is used if the if the model you retrieve from your external system, like from your inventory, is very complex. So if you get a huge complex model back and every one of you has a different opinion um, in which field this piece of software information should end up in your requisition or um, how the mapping into the open mass world should look like. Most of the sources here are actually simple enough that we can transfer them pretty directly in a, in a requisition. So <coughs> it's more for customizations later. And the last component we have is a scripts component. And that is where all your customizations come in. All the additional filters, all the additional rules and things that exist just in your company. So our custom default um, integration has to have a place where you can do your customization without going down the rabbit hole and changing all the source stuff and changing all the co uh, communication stuff, right? So, simple example for a script would be um, in your inventory all the node labels are uppercase and start with whatever prefix you want to get rid of that there's nothing we support out, out of the box, you, you have these small scripts that then you can attach. Um, for scripting language, you can use everything that's supported by the Apache uh, Bean script, yeah, Bean scripting framework. So, something like JRuby would be an option. Something like Ruby or BSF. Okay, that's the workflow we have. Um, you have an OpenMS instance running, and you use this URL. Um, provisioner and just put the address in of the HTTP server in Pris and you schedule a synchronization. So the OpenMS server for example once a day makes a request to the Pris server and says give me the requisition called OCS computers. Um, the driver receives that, starts um, the communication with the inventory server retrieves all the computers, maps them into a nice requisition. Maybe you have a custom script afterwards to do some tweaking and just provides it back as a HTTP response. Right? The nice thing with that is a HTTP response can be perfectly managed by your browser. So you can just use your web browser, go to the address of your Pris server and say, hey, give me the OCS computers requisition and boom you get your requisition in your browser just hit F5 and you get an update 
and you can read it, it's going to look the same um, like OpenOS is going to retrieve it. Right? So you have a, a preview thing. You can start and see how is the requisition I'll get from VMware going to look like, or how is the requisition I'm going to retrieve from um, your, your VMware um, integration or your DNS integration look like. And you can do basic checks of really is it really everything inside that I need, is that okay, and then you can be relaxed and wait until OpenMS is going to retrieve all that data. So as I said, the default mode for Pris is having a small web server and providing all that stuff via HTTP. And I also said that it's just a standalone application. It doesn't have to be on the same server like your main OpenMS instance. It doesn't have to be on the same <coughs> server like your inventory database or your custom CRDB. Um, it can basically be wherever was able to connect to your inventory and OpenMS can ask it for a requisition. And you can point as many OpenMSs on that Pris server as you like. And a Pris server instance can provide many different requisitions. So you can do things like you have a production in a instance of OpenOS running, you have a, a backup system running, you have a testing environment running, and you can all point them to the same Chris server and manage all your requisitions and generations of requisitions all in there. Okay? So you can centralize it if you want to. You can move the Chris server directly on the same server like your inventory or directly on your OpenOS server, whatever makes sense for you. Okay, so you are not very limited with that. Um, so you can can build it and model it like you want, because it's just a little bit of HTTP in the default mode, right? You're going to manage to pipe that around. And of course, you can always just use your browser, have a quick look. Everything's fine. Every node that should be there is there. Okay, so just as an overview for the source part, if you ask, uh, if you the sources we have or we would like to have. Uh, we have a spreadsheet source. I'm going to demo that quickly because it really gives an impression of this of mm -hmm. this uh, rapid updating and this this modeling of what you're doing. Um, it's kind of nice for smaller environments. We have a few hundred nodes, and you just want to get rid of the um, web UI approach, right? So everyone knows how to work with spreadsheets, how to order them, how to fill in a lot of columns automatically. So you, you get an idea about that soon. Um, for all of those guys that run a custom um, configuration database, um, like, like um, this group here, um, you probably have a database there that you can access from the outside world and just run a database query against it. So I'm going to show you briefly how you could just use um, the database source to create a requisition directly out of it without touching any code. Just build your query nicely and you're going to end up with a requisition. Um, then we have the OCS inventory source. It's probably the source that's um, the most sufficient we have at the moment because it's also <coughs> able to map a lot of custom fields, it's going to be able to do a lot of filtering and stuff. So it's, it's probably the best one we have at the moment. We have uh, a source for VMware, um, pretty much the, a pretty similar implementation um, like we've introduced for a while, but for Pris, so you can use it in the standalone fashion and you can use your own scripts to improve it. Um, all the others we don't have, they're just here because you're going to build them. So like the DNS one, or ones for specific products like uh, like InfoBlox, or uh, for certain stacks like CloudStack, or OpenStack, or who, whatever, right? The only thing you have to change is the source. The mechanism OpenOS is going to retrieve all that stuff is going to be the same. The mechanism how you do customizations in your script steps is going to be the same. So you just have one small piece you change. Do you assume that? A single consolidated data set coming back, or can you support going to multiple inventory sources and consolidating them? So, I assume that's on the next slide. No, that's not the next one, but the, the, the answer is yes. We can use Pris to query multiple inventories, 
get multiple sets of requisitions and merge them into one big one or enrich an existing one with data from this other other system that knows this one detail that we need in the monitoring, we can do <coughs> that. Um, I'll get to that. Um, configuration of OpenOS is always easy, yeah, totally intuitive, so we keep that trend. So the only thing you have to do is you configure your your driver, like do you want to use the HTTP mode? Probably yes. What IP address do you uh, should run on? In this case, the local one. And head um, a port, and then we are good. Then you create a folder with the same name that your requisition should have, um, and put in uh, another configuration file, would look like this. So that's the file structure you have. Down there is the, is the jar file on the same level as the global properties. It just says which port it should run on, which IP address it should listen to. And in this example, we have a folder called My Router. It contains a requisition properties file. We get to that, it's the next step. And there's a spreadsheet in the same um, file structure. So, so this requisition properties file defines one requisition. It has to live in a folder with an appropriate name. And the only thing you have to do in the, in the case that you want to run a spreadsheet, for example, is you put in the name of the source, you put in what kind of mapper you want to use. If you want to use, it, if you don't care about the mapper, you just put in an echo mapper. It's not going to do any magic. And in this case, for the XLS source, you have to have a reference to the file. And that's it. That's all you, that's all you put in. Your spreadsheet should look a bit like this. You should have node label, IP address, um, an interface type or management type, and off you go. And then you can just get a uh, retrieve your already appropriately built requisition from the Chris server. Um, at, the, uh, at the configured port and the name of the requisition, and boom, you get it back. Um, you never have to restart Pris, so if you do, do a change in the spreadsheet, you don't have to restart it, even if it's an old habit in OpenOS worlds that you want to restart it. You don't have to. You, you're allowed to, but you don't have to. Um, and you can just hit F5 and get it fresh <coughs> on and see it working. Or you hit F5 and see what you've messed up, and you just fix it, hit a five, you're good. So I tried to demo that live for you. I hope you can see everything okay-ish, if not just scream or do anything you want. Let's see. Though, that is, a sp that is an example spreadsheet for this case. And as a note label, we do a Ronnie has a very nice IP address. It's like, yeah, bad knows ever, whatever. We attach a new asset. Um, we force a service called SNMP on this interface, and he's in the VIP category. Okay. So everyone has an idea how this node should look like in <coughs> the end? Okay. So let me save this. Um, there, read it. So in the browser window, what you hopefully can read is a call to localhost 8000. So that's where my Pris server runs. And I'm asking for the sample requisition. And there is a node with a foreign ID, not uh, Ronnie, and a node label called Ronnie. It has uh, its IP interface we wanted to have. It has the service we wanted to have. Um, it has a category called VIP, and it has an asset called description uh, with a value, best test node ever. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the entire configuration for that, just to to see that it's not magic. It's just bits and pieces. Um, so in my Pris folder, there's these global properties. Oops. 
And the only real active configuration in there is the driver <coughs> that we want to do HTTP, which port, and that's the IP address, can be whatever. And the only thing we have in this sample folder in the requisition properties is I want to use the XLS source, the name of the file, and I don't want to do anything strange in addition. Okay? So just to prove that that is really happening, we can also do a, an ulf here, get the different IP address, get the different primary type, whatever text here. We do a different service like SSH. Maybe we want to have a second one like ICMP. It's also in the VIP category, or let's do the OGP category. And I save that, reload it over here, boom, there's Ulf. So the workflow would be pretty much the same if you connect to a database. It would have the same configuration snippets. You would retrieve the requisition in the same way in your browser, and it would also update the same way, right? So if you want to go a little further, we could also add a completely new kind of category, like a category for the, I don't know, fluffiness or color or size. And uh, I think Ronnie has an S, Wolf is something like an XS. I just save that, reload that, boom, there we are. Can you see that? You have the category name S and the category uh, XS on the new nodes. You can just add them on the fly. Just build it in, go. Um, can also just go ahead and make an asset. Let's say it's a city asset. And he's from Fulda. And he's unknown. Save it, reload it, there we go. So we have totally valid asset entries there. All good. So you can use this uh, category columns to build whatever semantic you want, right? So you can also make a more useful category like uh, category, um, let's say, importance or or task, job, let's call it job. And Ronnie is a developer. He's also a consultant. Or let's see, he's also an OGP. And Ulf is. doesn't have a job here. So you can put every category in a single column, or you just put them all <coughs> in one, or split, split it how you want, just add a comma, and, add the op, uh, and off we go. Okay, so that is a spreadsheet one. We don't recommend using spreadsheets to manage big networks just more like an example or something you could do if you're in the 400, 500, 600 node range and you just don't have anything better. So that can be a step in between. Um, let's move over to something more um, useful for bigger environments. Um, there's a source for JDBC. Um, That is a, an example how you um, create a new requisition from a database. So the only thing we have for this database is um, we know what kind of database it is. So we know, in this case, we use the MySQL driver. Then we know where it is. So we know, please use the JDBC driver to connect to the MySQL database, which runs on the domain PHP IPAM and that is address where it runs, right? So you add your credentials and then you are perfectly able to run uh, select statements against it. And this is the entire select statement to get a proper requisition from the PHP IPAM project. It's, a, it's an open source project for IP management. It was the first time we tested the, the JDBC connector. Works nice. So how is the JDBC connector 
uh, the JDBC source work, how does it translate into a requisition? It's pretty simple. Um, in this case, it selects the ID from the table of, um, of PHP IPAM, and then you have this as foreign ID statement. I think I can highlight it like this. And you have as node label <coughs> and as this uh, asset description. So if you just label the columns you get back with uh, the appropriate keywords, it's directly translated into a requisition. And you can just sit there, go to your browser, hit a five, and say, okay, now I get all the uh, cities. And then you just improve your query and you make the next part. So if you have a database guy next to you who knows little about the schema of your um, custom database, you're going to get somewhere very quickly with that. Um, another example for that that I can actually execute here, it's a bit, it's a bit, a bit advanced, a bit more complicated, is this one. Database queries can get crazy. Just if you have a look at the, at the top, it's a JDBC source again. It uses the PostgreSQL driver. It connects to a local host of my OpenMS database and connects to my OpenMS database and reads from this database the entire requisition. It's just a demo use case um, which we can actually execute. Uh, maybe we can just remove this. Which one could we remove? Um, this description thing. Oops. Still works, and we shouldn't have any descriptions anymore. Put them in, map them in, hit a five, should work. So that was a the spreadsheet based requisition, which is for demo purposes, the JDBC one. Um, and we had the question about can I connect to multiple um, sources of inventory? Let's say you have your customer database, but the, and, and the, the service you should have, but the detailed information about, let's say, support contracts or, or the detailed location is in a third or second system. So what you can do for to, um, to address that um, is you use a merge source. The so merge source is not able to create any fancy new requisitions. It doesn't know how to talk to um, a certain DB or something. The only thing the merge source is doing is it gets from a HTTP address a requisition and from another HTTP address, another requisition. And then you can just configure a little bit how it should merge them together. Okay? So a quick look at the config is... Looks like that in, in a simple case. So we use the requisition merge source. Then we have requisition A and requisition B. Both come from a URL. <coughs> in this case, both URLs actually are provided by Pris itself. And then they get merged and provided. So if you have a look at that step by step, then there is a requisition configured behind this port 8000 that's called A. So if I just go here, and we have a look at the requisition called A. Then I see I have a foreign ID A, node label A, IP address 111 and that's a proper node. So it's actually a requisition that is configured in Pris via the spreadsheet. The other one is called B. Um, and B has a foreign ID <coughs> B, node label B, and a node A. So what to do with that? There's an A node and a B node. 
and it's already not merged. So what is merge thing doing? If you call the merge requisition, then this configuration kicks in and first reads, uh, reads the A requisition, then it reads the uh, requisition B and merge them into each other. So as you can see there, you have the node A and it actually contains a category that was provided from requisition B. So that is a category from B in the bottom. But the node B that was in this one requisition is missing. So one requisition had one node, the other had two nodes, now we has, have just one. And it's a different one. So what happens by default in the merge source is it just looks in the first requisition and then it searches in the second requisition for additional information for the nodes that it already knows. So it's just enriching. And the, the key to say, oh, we are talking about the same node, is the foreign ID of the node. So if the foreign ID of the node is matching, then it's merging these two nodes into each other and making one bigger or more precise node out of it. If we want to have a different effect, like we want to have every single node that has been in requisition B and every single node that has been in requisition A, and the ones that have the same name, we just merge those into each other, then we can use um, additional flags to do that. What do you mean by the same name? Uh, if they have the fo same foreign ID in two requisitions, like say you have a rec tables and uh, OCS um, requisition, and as long as the nodes have the same foreign ID, then they are considered to be the same node and get, it and and get merged. If they have different foreign IDs, they are treated like completely individual nodes and are not going to be merged. So you can use this, um, this approach to get the inventory from this server and the additional information about the hardware from this server and just build a merged approach and make it more and more and more um, specific. And then you just point your OpenMS on the best um, enhanced merge together so, uh, requisition you have. The nice thing is you can just tune and and improve your uh, the single requisitions step by step <coughs> and you can see the uh, results in between and then you can go to the next step and say okay requisition A is the exactly the way I want to have it, requisition B is the way I ha want to have it, let's see how the merged one looks and if it's okay you point your OpenMS against it. Um, I think uh, that are the main parts for the demo. I'm probably going to skip a few slides here. Let's say. So parts of the demo are on the slide deck as addition, so that you get an idea how the uh, sources work. Here's again the JDBC stuff. We did that in the demo. Here's an example for the uh, merge source, we did that in the demo too. Um, what we haven't done yet is the script step thing. Um, from our experience, it's very hard to build a uh, uh, integration with a system you've never seen <coughs> in use at a certain company and build it in a way that it fits exactly their customizations, like naming conventions, um, all these, all these details that you just can't know up front. So what we try is, we try to build into Pris certain spaces where you can put in your small script. Everything is default besides these small scripts and there are defined spaces so it's easy for us to see what are they doing and I can just remove them and see if everything else works. Right? Um, I'm going to show you a small example for what you can do with a script. It's based on the on one of the spreadsheets. Let's see Over there. That is a sample requisition from the beginning with Ronnie and Ulf. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable a small script.
down here you can add multiple scripts just reference to them, you can make an entire list of them, they're going to be executed in that order and in this case it's a location um, script that enhances the way how the locations are added to the nodes. So Ronnie at the moment um, has one category that's called VIP and if I reload the page VIP is integrated in the script step and a lot of additional information is added. So VIP in this case stands actually <coughs> for a small Italian town called Vipiteno and in the script I just check does a node has this category VIP and if it has the VIP category please add um, the address and the city and the zip code and the country and the latitude and the longitude all this tedious stuff that you might have in some convention already in your requisitions. So probably a lot of, of your nodes have magic categories that have strange meanings or, may or uh, huge node labels that have strange meanings encoded. With the script step you can just read that stuff, translate it, add it to the node and have it in a central place. Okay. So if I would add the, let's have a look at the script. <coughs> there are a few imports at the top. Don't don't get scared away by those. I think the the really important part is, is this line. The script already gets a requisition that's already valid and already okay and you just iterate over the nodes in the requisition and make your basic check. Like for each node that you have, hand me over every category and make it a basic check and if the category matches Vipteno, please add a new asset field with the following name and so on and so on. So that's one example and can th things like that can help tremendously to reduce um, boring maintenance work on functions like that. Okay. So what else do we have? We have a few more facts. Um, if you want to get any additional information about that uh, particular project, Ronnie and I are probably the best informed ones. The source code lives there. The documentation really exists. It's not just a dead link. We really documented pretty much everything. And um, the issues are tracked over there. And what we would actually like to do as next steps is get in contact with you guys and see what are the main tools you use and you would like to integrate as a source. And and see if the next steps that's required is maybe build in a REST push driver. It's all the stuff you don't have to worry about then because it's, it's one project. So are there any particular tools that, um, that you're running where you say, okay, that is the thing where I need an integration for? Or is all the stuff you have so custom at the moment that it's, it's hard to say? Any questions about that tool? Great. This is uh, a little off the side, but at the beginning you showed the spreadsheet that you were using. <coughs> Could that be a Google Docs spreadsheet? Would it be possible to read a normal spreadsheet like that? Um, at the moment we are just able to read uh, XLS sheets, okay. so you could export it, but the, all the logic, how to interpret different columns and all the stuff, um, it's easy to transfer. So if you want to do that in a Google <coughs> Docs spreadsheet, why not? It shouldn't be that hard. And you ju would just have to... Um, the, the entire spreadsheet mechanism itself is already built. We just have to um, get the rows and columns. That's one thing we have. Any other questions? <coughs> Good, so that's it.